There's something that God tells me that gives me the greatest of hope and encouragement as I think about some of the things that Zach just said that all of us go through because my dad used to say in his sermons, he used to say, you got a story, I got a story, all God's children got a story. And every one of us can dig deep within our minds, our hearts, our psyche, our memories, and we can think of those things that most certainly will take us to our greatest joys and to our greatest sorrows. This is the reason why we depend upon our God and our Father in heaven, because there are so many things that we don't understand. There are so many things that happen in our lives that make no sense to us. Many things happen, we're not ready for them to happen. We're not ready for people to leave, for them to die, for them to forsake us, or for them to be gone or out of our minds. I remember an episode of a rifleman when Lucas and his son, I believe his name was Mark, they were leaving, it was toward the end of the series, and he was looking back. And his dad told him, don't look back. He said, I wasn't looking back, I was remembering back. And all of us from time to time, we remember back. And we think of our grandparents as I do, my great-grandparents, my parents, all of whom are already gone to meet their maker. And I am rapidly becoming the oldest person in my family. And as my children and my grandchildren and my nieces and nephews and my brothers and sisters look toward me, I'm reminded of what I used to feel about my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather because they were men who conducted themselves as Christian men. They gave me an example of what I ought to be. I am so proud of this congregation. I'm proud of the fact that your young minister and his wife are here, folks, uh, two young people that you have influenced and raised and taught who know what your values are, your beliefs are, what you stand for, what you fight for. They understand that, and you made a very wise decision in having one of your own to be here to serve you as a servant in the church. And when each of us look to the Scriptures, there's something that God says to us. God tells us that those things, as the Apostle Paul was teaching us, those things that are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and of the Scriptures, hope of the Scriptures, we might have hope, we might have understanding, we might have assurance. The Scriptures give us that hope, give us that understanding, that perception, that vision that each and every one of us have got to have if we're going to make it in this world that we're living in. As God gave us intelligence and intuitiveness and the abilities to look at both sides, He also gave us examples within the Scripture so that we could become the people we ought to become. God gave us the example of Elijah. Elijah lay there under the sycamore tree saying, I'm the last one. God just killed me. Just take my life. Jezebel wants to kill me after all I've done my life is in danger. God just let me die. Jonah did the same thing when God forgave Nineveh. He lay there under a bush that God allowed to grow up rapidly. Just let me die. Just let me die. Because from time to time, because we don't have the vision, as I have quoted every evening, as Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10 and 23, O Lord, Jeremiah himself, who found himself questioning what God had commanded him to preach and to teach, that's why he's called the weeping prophet. Because many times the message that God gave to him to give to the people broke his heart. And he wept and he cried and he pleaded for the people. Just as Abraham did for Sodom and Gomorrah, many times we can't see what God sees. Which is why God tells us not to question him. For we look on the outward appearance, but God says he's looking within the heart. So God lets us know that Saul, while he may have been a good man when he was made king, when God chose David, he says, I'm looking for a better man. And God looks at each and every one of us from time to time. And the Bible is written in comparative language so that we can look within God's word 
and become the people that God wants us to be. Every one of us need to be trying to go to heaven. We need to do all we can to be saved, all that we can to leave this world because this is not our home and prepare ourselves to go home one day. It's most likely in the early spring during the third extensive evangelistic campaign of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is well into that campaign. It's about 57 A.D. And the background of many of the churches that he preached was similar to the church he was preaching to at this particular time, the church at Corinth. Paul had written letters to Colossae, to uh, Philippi, to Timothy who was at Crete, to, uh, to Titus who was at Crete, to Timothy who was at Ephesus. The Apostle Paul had struggled, he had preached, he had suffered for what is right. But he's a man who had to deal with himself and struggle with himself and change himself in the same way that many of us have to do. I thank God for putting Paul's life in his background within the scripture because it allows me to know to know no matter who we are, how far we have fallen and what we have done, how terrible the events in our life may have been. That God is a God of a second chance. God is a God of a remake, a reboot, and a restart. If we will repent, that's all God asks of us to change our life. So when Paul is talking to the churches like Corinth and others, often he's compelled to speak to each of them in the same way he did the churches in the Galatian region. The Galatian region was a series of churches and different cultures and ethnicities that lived in that region. And in Galatians chapter 1 and verses 6, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Paul gives his amazement at the way the world is affecting God's people. Paul said, I marvel, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul said, I just can't believe at this point that you're actually going to believe in another Savior, in another Redeemer, in another way to go to heaven, in another way to please God. Paul says, I marvel. Paul is saying, I know I taught y'all the truth. I have not shunned to preach the gospel to any of you. So the Apostle Paul at this time is absolutely amazed that men and women that he had taught, that he had baptized, that he had instructed, that he had brought from sin and idolatry and perversion, that they were going to listen to the Judaizing teachers and the purveyors of idolatry rather than staying strong with the Lord. In the book of Galatians chapter 5, as he talked to the churches in the Galatian region, in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 1, the apostle Paul told them to stand fast, stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And I want you to notice this word Paul uses. And become not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In essence, stay away from the enemy. Don't let the enemy tempt you and entice you away from your zone of safety to where you become enticed and entangled in those things that will cause you to lose your soul. One of the traps used in the ancient world was a rope that had been fitted and knotted in such a way that when an animal ran across it, he would be entangled. And the more he fought, the more entangled he become until you were able to go up on him and hit him or whatever you were going to do to knock him out. And then that animal being trapped by his own movements is now lost. How many times have we seen ourselves enticed? And it seems the more and the harder we fight, the worse it gets. I remember in 1969, we went to the Mid-South Fair in Memphis, Tennessee. And I had worked, I had, I had bailed hay, I had worked in the hay barn. I had 
uh, driven uh, tractors. I had done so much with me and my friend. Both of us started preaching on the same day uh, back in, in, in the, uh, um, 1967. And we had worked hard. We had cut yards. And we had a pocket full of money. We had $50. That was a lot of money at that particular time. And we went to the fair, and my daddy always seemed to know how stupid we were. And my dad would say, Nick, you keep up with us. Don't spend your money. Say so you work too hard for that money, just get food to eat and do a few things, but don't waste all your money. We got to a particular tent, and they had the watches, and in those days a transistor radio was hanging up there. And a watch was up there, a hang, a sitting up there in the box. And we stopped. The man said, come over here. And I don't remember if it was shooting something or throwing something or whatever it was. But before we left there, it seems like, okay, now we got too much invested. We got to keep on going. Give me another dollar. We put another dollar. We got too much. We can't stop now, Herschel. We got too much invested. And we went on before we walked away from there. Being in the fair about 20 minutes, we were broke. He had all of my $50, and I walked away from there feeling extremely stupid because I allowed myself to be tempted and played by that juggler to where he knew that once I got in a certain point, he just entrapped me and pulled me in until he got all of my money. My daddy went to his grave never knowing, because if he did know, I didn't tell him. And, and you know, all of our lives, uh, I never told him about what happened there at the fairground because it was embarrassing, because I knew better. And even though my better sense was saying, you need to stop, at least give up this, take a loss, walk away. It's something in me, the pride, I could see myself with that Elgin watch on Monday at school. I could see myself with that transistor radio with the six volt battery in it, walking down school being a big shot. And that lust and that enticement pulled me until he had cleaned my pocket out. Well, that's exactly what the devil wants to do to every last one of us. He wants to get us entangled, as Paul said. And that's why Peter said, be sober and be vigilant. And when we think about what Paul is trying to get the church to do and to think about, Paul said, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. Think about that. Jesus said one time, you shall know the truth. And the truth keeps you in unentangled. The truth keeps you out of the traps. The truth keeps you from blindly walking through life. The truth shall set you free. The truth is a liberator. And those who are caught up in the lies of the devil, the lies of the politicians, the lies of the academians, the lies of the world today, they're caught up in those things that entangle and entrap. And as Paul said, keep us in a yoke of bondage. And then Paul went on to tell them in verses 7 of that same chapter, he said, which is not another. In other words, it's not another gospel. It's not another good news. It's not another plan of salvation. It's not another lifestyle that's worth living. He said, not another, but there be those that trouble you, that trouble you, that bring trouble in your life. Trouble in your mind, trouble in your family, trouble with your children, trouble in your relationships. There be those that trouble you, Paul said, that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Jesus Christ says, I came to give you rest. That word rest from a Greek term means peace. It means liberation. It means assurance. It means the ability to feel as though you and God are in a good place and a good relationship. This is why Jesus calls us from the traps, from the entanglements, and says, come to me, come to me, 
all of you that labor, all of you that are struggling, whatever it is you're struggling with, come to me. If you're struggling with false doctrine, you're sitting somewhere every day, every Sunday, and the Bible's saying one thing and your leader's saying another thing. The Bible's leading you one way and your leaders are leading you another way. You've got to turn to the Lord. He said, come to me. All of you that labor are struggling and are heavy laden. And the Lord said, I will give you rest. The Apostle Paul is disappointed with our brethren in the Galatian region. He says, why are you such an easy target? Why were you so quick to desert? Don't you know that you're soldiers of the cross? That you are warriors of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why are you connecting with the enemy, being entangled in the enemy's trap? And all of us from time to time have to take an introspective examination of ourselves because so many of us have an identity crisis in the Lord's church. We are allowing the world to tell us that we're inadequate. We're on the wrong side of history. We're the ones following an old Bronze Age book that's out of style and out of date. We're the ones trying to raise our children with some narrow-minded biblical standard of ethics and morality. We're the ones that are refusing to allow our children and our families to have a worldview and a world vision that would give them the liberation to try other lifestyles and other things. Paul is saying, why were you so gullible? Why were you such an easy target? Why are you defecting to the enemy? And when you look at that, uh, Paul uses the, the term heteron basically saying it's not a different kind of gospel. It is not the gospel at all. Then the apostle Paul gave them a stern warning. In verses 8, he gave them a wake-up call when he said, but though we... Or an angel from heaven. Paul said, even if I come preaching something different, even if I come violating the things that I told you earlier, he said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which I have preached. Let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Let him be eternally condemned in your eyes. Don't invite him into your house and do not bid him God speed. And so when we look at this, the Apostle Paul had a lot of changes. And God, what I appreciate about God so much, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As I told you last evening, three divine personalities, one divine nature, or one aim. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in inspiring and giving us this word, told us the truth. I know I can see David standing there before the nine-foot giant Goliath with five smooth stones and a slingshot with the Philistine army laughing at this little boy who in a minute is going to be on the end of Goliath's sword and meet for the birds. I can see them laugh until that stone hits Goliath in the forehead and David takes that same sword and removes his head, and the army is routed. I can see that day of courage, but I can also see that day when he stood on that balcony and looked at another man's wife and took him, took her, and took his life. I can see Noah 120 years preaching the truth. It's going to rain, children. It's going to rain. And God gave him an order, and God gave him the blueprints of the box that was going to carry the seed of man and animals and plants to the new world. And God, when he gave him his word, God said, build me an ark of gopher wood. God, God wanted him to know that this is my boat because this is my business, and I'm designing it. Build me an ark of gopher wood. When God gave Noah that, that order and that command, and he didn't say, now, don't use walnut and don't bother 
a pecan tree. I don't want magnolia. I don't want cherry. Don't cut down pine, but I want gopher wood. God didn't say any of that because the truth in God's word is both inclusive and exclusive at the same time. God includes that which he wants. He excludes that which he does not want. When God commanded us to sing with the spirit and the understanding, God didn't have to say don't blow, don't beat, don't hum, don't stomp, don't play, don't pluck, don't blow. God didn't have to say any of that. When he said sing, that was inclusive and exclusive at the same time. And what we have to understand, the devil has always, as I told you Sunday, put a comma where God has put a period or a question mark or an exclamation point. When God has spoken, then the orders have been given. So God gives me in the scripture, he shows me the life and demonstrates to me how Noah used gopher wood, how he put that one door and that one window there. And you know what? God closed the door. He didn't leave it for Noah. Noah may have said, ain't that Uncle Boochie out there swimming? Isn't that Uncle Ed out there? Open the door. No, God closed the door. And when God closed the door, they could not reopen it because God gave them 120 years in order to repent, to change, and to alter their behavior. But God also shows me the Noah that leaves that ark who has the ability to make that wine, that alcoholic beverage. God tells me how he's drunk and naked in his tent because God gives me both sides. God tells me about Solomon, how Solomon stood to, to follow his father to the throne. And when God said, what do you want, Solomon? Solomon said, give me wisdom, for I am but a child, and I have to follow my father and rule this great people. God said, because you didn't ask for the life of your enemies, or a long life, or great riches, I'm going to give you all of them. And therefore Solomon was given more than anybody before him. But you understand something. While Solomon was the laboratory of human experience, Solomon had everything. Solomon said, I had everything my eyes desired. But Solomon had to say something. It was vanity. Vanity and vexation of spirit. Why Solomon? Because Solomon allowed these things to pull him away from his God. God was displeased with Solomon and all of those women that he brought and their religions that perverted the people and perverted his house. God said to Solomon, I'm going to take the kingdom from you, but I'm not going to do it because of David. I'm not going to do it while you live. In essence, God shows me both sides of all of them. So when I go to the scripture, I see the other side of Paul the apostle, a man who was shipwrecked, a man who was snake bit, a man who was beaten, tied to a Roman soldier, as I told you the other day. But I see the other side because God tells me about him. Son of Tarsus was the profile of a self-righteous, cold, merciless, zealot, blind, misguided, as someone who had no pity. He was politically powerful. He was connected. He was a Jewish aristocrat. He was a Roman soldier, a Roman citizen. Paul hated the Romans, but he loved the trappings that Roman citizenship gave him. He hated the fact that they ruled his people, the Jews. But he loved the fact that he was wealthy, well-connected, could go to the best schools, had, had money and riches. So the apostle Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, God shows us a man that compromises, capitulates, and has given up what he had to give up in order to go along to get along. There is nothing about Saul of Tarsus that says gospel preacher, but God knows our hearts. He pursued, arrested, jailed, and even assisted in the execution of Christian. 
It was Saul of Tarsus that stood there. When that young man was just revealing the scheme of redemption, when Stephen clearly made a defense of the faith, a defense of the gospel, a defense of the deity of Jesus Christ, the sovereignty of God, Stephen gave that defense in such a way that they were angered. And the Bible tells me they drugged this man like a dog on the outside of town. They gnashed on him with their teeth. They beat on him with their fists. And there was a man standing there. It was Saul of Tarshish. And they laid their coats and their purses and their valuables down at his feet while he oversaw the execution of that fine gospel preacher. Saul of Tarshish, that record is there, and he gives it even himself as the memory of it seems to gnaw at him day and night. The Bible tells me in the book of Acts chapter 8 and verses 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, <coughs> committing them to prison. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 22 and verses 4 and somewhat of his own personal confession, Paul says, And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prison men and women. Can you imagine how that must have been on his heart when he thought about these things? Because Paul was credentialed, but he was not spiritual. He was religious, but he was hypocritical. He was one of those individuals that we often see in religion, in politics, in academia, in the corporate world. He was one of those who could style, smile, and profile and never be real and genuine. He became the type of individual that said, I verily thought that I should do all things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. Apparently, he was born into religious, and you know, if you look at this, it's the tale of two rabbis. The tale of two rabbis. You've got one rabbi who is rich, who is credentialed, who was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. As a matter of fact, in the book of Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through verses 7, the apostle Paul makes this claim. He says, Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think it, that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, Paul said, I more. He goes on to give his credentials, circumcised on the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As touching the law, I was a Pharisee. In essence, he says, I had all eyes dotted, so to speak, T's cross. I had all the credentials. Educated by Gamaliel, graduate of the church of the school, the University of Tarsus. But you know what Paul said? I give it all up. When he became the Apostle Paul, and as I said last evening, when he met the Lord on the Damascus Road, when the Lord asked him, Why are you persecuting me, Paul? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When he came to reckoning, you know what he said? All of that stuff never made me a better person. And that's why Solomon said, uh, looking at all of the stuff that he had, Solomon said it is vanity and vexation of spirit. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, Paul, uh, 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 Solomon said, let's hear the conclusion to the whole matter. Solomon said, fear God. Keep his commandments. Why, Solomon? For this is the whole duty of man. Solomon realized the same thing Saul of Tarsus realized. All of this stuff didn't make me a better person. The other rabbi, whose name is Jesus, he said something for every one of us to think about. He said, as he spoke in that wonderful sermon on a hill, obscure hill, with the natural acoustics of the Sea of Galilee behind him. 
He said to all of us, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust are corrupt and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor thieves break through and steal. He says, here is why. Where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. This other rabbi, while Saul was striving for credentials, while he was striving for political power, there was a young man that the Bible speaks about in the book of Luke chapter 2. And Luke chapter 2 verses 52 says that he grew in wisdom when he was on that occasion when he had left his father and mother and they were astonished, the Bible says, by those things which he knew. In verses 47, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding. Then the Bible says that Jesus was the full package. He grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. He grew in favor of God. He grew in favor of men. In essence, he grew in wisdom. Jesus grew intellectually. We should train our children. We should educate ourselves. God never ordered us to be ignorant and unlearned and untaught. That's why he gave us the scripture. And he gave us intelligence and intuitiveness and reason. He gave us talent and abilities. God never told us not to educate ourselves. He never told us not to prosper. He always told us seek first. In other words, whatever I give you, wherever I place you, if I place you in a house that costs a million dollars or in a house that costs a hundred dollars, wherever you find yourself, you seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, and I will continue to bless you when you put me first. So the Lord, as he grew, he grew intellectually because he grew in wisdom. The Bible says he grew in stature. Jesus took care of his physical body. There is a very hard day lying ahead of him. Lying ahead of Jesus is 39 stripes on the scourging post when 10 would kill most men. Lying ahead of Jesus is a 100-pound cross that's going to be put on his shoulders that after he has been beaten half to death, he's got to carry that cross. Don't you understand that the devil wanted Jesus to die when they were beating him in the alley, blindfolded him. And the Roman soldiers had a way because going to Golgotha, going to that place of the skull was punishment duty because there was rotted bodies. There were wolves and dogs and buzzards and there were mourning, dying men. Nobody wanted to go. They would have their faces covered. They would wrap their hands, the maggot filled uh, uh, garbage, and dead and dying bodies were all around. They took Jesus to an alley. They put a blindfold on him, and with all of their might, they beat him. They would hit Jesus. Who hit you? They would hit him again. Who hit you? They would turn him around and hit him again with all of their might. Who hit you? And you know the Son of God knew who hit him. But it was not for him to say at this time. Jesus grew in wisdom and he grew in stature. God strengthened his body. And every one of us should take care of this physical plant the best we can because God has work for us to do. When you look at a carpenter in those days, he may have worked with wood a little bit, but there wasn't a whole lot of wood. You didn't cut down trees, and there wasn't a whole lot of wood to be cut down. Many times the carpenter would make those bowls that the women made their meal and their flour, that they beat the barley and the wheat and the corn so that they could make bread. God had Jesus carrying boulders as a son and carrying other heavy objects to help his father. Jesus was not what Hollywood shows you. Don't let Hollywood fool you that Jesus was some little flyaway thing. Jesus took 39 licks 
from the most hideous object of torture that a man could put in his hand. That thing had iron balls. It had hooks that would pull flesh from his body. It would bludgeon him. And Jesus grew in wisdom and he grew in stature. He was strong. He was physically strong because God does nothing arbitrarily. God knew that Jesus was going to have that day. He couldn't die in the alley. He couldn't die on the scourge and post. He couldn't die on the way to the cross. There is no plan B. If Jesus don't get on that cross and say it is finished, then we have no salvation. There is no plan B where God's going to come up with another way. This way was decided on before the foundation of the world, as I told you last evening, when Eve sinned and brought death upon mankind. God said, this is not over. You may have brought man down through the woman, but through the woman I'm going to bring her back up again, and I'm going to bring life through the woman. Jesus brought the woman her integrity back. When Jesus was on the cross on Golgotha's hill, only John of those 12 strong, courageous men, only John was there. But the women were there. They would not run. They did not forsake him. They did not turn on him. Jesus brought the woman her integrity back that was lost in the garden. So therefore, this rabbi, this young man grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor of God. He grew spiritually. As the scriptures say, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, as the Hebrew writer says, but was in all ways tempted just as we are, yet without sin. In essence, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. When folks looked at Jesus, they would say, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? His brothers, James and others, Joseph and Judas, Jesus was the one that when they looked at him, they're saying what they said in John chapter 1 and verses 46. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Instead of him being lawed and lifted up like Paul wanted to be, Jesus, the Bible says, the common people heard him gladly. The cry and the mentality of our day is no different what it was then. It was, you know, be yourself. Enjoy yourself. And today, explore your individuality. But Jesus taught us how to be a servant. Once the Lord had come, once Paul was converted, God wanted simple, plain preaching to be that which changed the world. In the book of Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through verses 3, the apostle Paul now different, different from Saul of Tarsus, different from what he used to be. He says, Paul, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I want you to note something right here. The highest title in the church is servant, is servant. The highest title is not preacher. It's not evangelist. It's not elder. It's not deacon. It's not teacher. It's not prophet. The highest title in the Lord's church is servant. When each of those men began their epistles, the highest title they gave themselves was servant. A good elder in the church is a servant. A good preacher and evangelist in the church is a servant. A good deacon and teacher in the church is a servant. So Paul said, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. And that says, Paul, why did you change? He told them in the very next verse, he said, in hope of eternal life. Brothers and sisters, if you miss heaven, you've missed it all. 
If you don't hear God say, well done, you hear him say, depart from me. If he don't call you with the sheep, then he shush you away with the goats. You don't want to stand before a living God with a Savior who comes. And they told the apostles as they were standing there gazing up in the heaven. They came, the angel says, why are y'all gazing up in the heaven? What did he tell you to do? Peter knew what he told him to do. Because on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached on that day, he told that bunch of murderers, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God, you, you have taken and with wicked hands crucified and slain, whom God have raised up, having loosed the pains of death, for it was not possible for him to be held of it. In essence, Peter on that day, having recovered from that moment of breach, that moment of cowardice, that moment of faithlessness, when he denied the Lord three times, he stood on that day, and that boy preached that sermon on that day. And those 12 men looked that bunch of cutthroats in the eye, and they stood for what was right. They could hear the Lord. One day they were on a boat, and the boat was shaking. And the Lord, who was tired from walking miles and miles to preach, was taking a short nap in the bottom of the boat. And they came down waking the Lord up. Jesus, Jesus, wake up, Jesus. Oh, wake up, Jesus. Wake up. Don't you care that we perish? Jesus came upon the ship, the top of the ship. And I believe rubbing his eyes because he was tired. He didn't have a vehicle to be chauffeured in. He didn't have a place that was comfortable like y'all have placed me in this week. Jesus was sleeping under the stars, probably laying in his head on a rock with part of his robe covering the rock. Now he's on this boat. He stands there before the winds and the waves. And he says, peace, be still. And the apostles are looking, saying, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? But you know what Jesus did next? He turned and he looked at them. And he said, why were you so timid? Why are you so fearful? Why are you so scary? Don't you know if there's a boat on the planet that won't sink, it's the one that the Son of God is on. Why are you so fearful? And I think that when the Lord looks at us and he realized that Peter at that moment was having a weak moment, he knew that he was going to stand and preach that sermon. But the Holy Spirit put that incident in the book for each of us to understand that a man that bows to the Lord bows to no one else. That the person that fears the Lord fears no one else. That the person who trusts in the Lord does not have to have a life where there is no assurance and no peace. God is saying to every one of us, I will never leave you. Don't you know that? I won't leave you. I will never forsake you. And the Apostle Paul, once he had his awakening moment, he had to understand what uh, what uh, uh, the Lord had been trying to teach him all along. I used to sit at the dinner table with my mother and my father every evening when I was a little boy. I got baptized in the fourth grade. I started studying the Bible. By the time I got to the fifth grade and the sixth grade, Zach, I knew I could preach. I just knew that I could preach. I would ask my daddy, can I preach in that big old church that we were at in Memphis that had five or six hundred members? And we would stand in line so we could pass out the offering and pass the communion and do various things. And my daddy said, no, Nick, you're not ready. You're not ready. I would quote scriptures to him. He said, that doesn't matter. You're not ready. I would show him my little outlines that I had done. He would say, it doesn't matter. You're not ready. And I didn't understand that it was a, a subject of contention at the dinner table night after night after night. I even set up a church 
in my bedroom where all of my brothers and sisters and cousins, but my church broke up. They said I preached too long. <laughs> and so this went on for years. Eventually, my dad was transferred to the small church there in Crockett County. He was transferred. He worked at the post office. And we went to that little small church. And we went to that little bitty church when my family went to that building, to that church, to that church of 25 or 30 people, where every Sunday I had to do something. I had to lead the songs or do the communion. It wasn't about being cute anymore. It wasn't about being a big shot anymore. It was about being a servant. And he said, this is what I've been trying to tell you all along. So your mind wasn't right. Your heart wasn't right. You didn't want to do it for the right reasons. He said, now, and when I was 15, he let me preach my first sermon. He said, because now you understand what I've been trying to tell you all the time. The Apostle Paul was one of those individuals who was lost in his own competence. Too many of us look at the blessings that God gives us as rewards for our competence and not blessings from God. Everything I have, it doesn't matter what I have, everything I have is from God. So what does God want from us? When the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 4 and verses 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. When he said in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, This know also that in the last days, peerless times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent fears, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Then he said, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. In essence, Paul said there are going to be those that are like a mannequin in the store. They look like a human being. They dress them up like a human being. They pose them like a human being, but they have no life. They have only a form, but there is no substance and no life. And Paul said many will be that way. What did Paul give as the remedy? Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. What's the remedy to change the world? Preach the word. Preach the word. What do we do to heal broken homes? Preach the word. To raise our children. Preach the word. To heal our nation. Preach the word. That's the only formula that we have. To preach the word. And when we lose sight of that, we've lost sight of the only thing that can save us, and the only thing that can help us in the time in which we live. The Apostle Paul said to the brethren, I press, I press, I press. He's pressing toward the mark. I am struggling, I'm pushing. My daughter used to run track. As a matter of fact, when the University of Memphis was in the Great Midwest Conference, she won the pentathlon. And she uh, was just a few seconds from the Olympics, but she hurt her knee. And I can think of times when I would watch her run, when her body would be stretched as she is pressing toward that finish line. She was a hurdler, and she could go over those hurdles so smoothly. And when you get to that finish line, she's pressing toward the line. The Apostle Paul says, I'm pressing, I am pushing, and I am doing all that I can to save myself and those that hear me. You know what Paul said to each of us? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, be steadfast. Be steadfast. Don't rock. Don't compromise. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't be afraid. Don't run. Don't capitulate. Be steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Our enemy said in 1963, I may have mentioned this Sunday, 
But I remember watching this, and I remember listening to our teachers talk about this when we studied our weekly reader back in the day, that Nikita Khrushchev, who was over Russia at that particular time, said, we're going to take your country. We're going to take America. We're going to destroy America. And he said, we're going to do it without firing a shot. And I thought about that, and I Googled it the other night to make sure that I was remember, remembering what I thought I heard. And the speech was right there, where he says, we will take America without firing a shot. He said, we're going to turn your black people against your white people, your white people against your red people, your red people against your yellow people, your northern people against your southern people, the rich against the poor, the educated against the illiterate, those that have against the have-nots. He said, we can't destroy you from the outside, so we're going to make you destroy yourself from the inside. Abraham Lincoln wasn't the first to say it. Jesus was the first to say it. That a house divided against itself will not stand. The church needs to understand this. We preach the truth. We stand for what is right. The Lord said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Moses had commanded to love one another. Joshua had commanded to love one another. Jeremiah, it was not a new commandment. It was a new standard. He said, you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus sacrificed himself for us. And he said, y'all watch each other's back. Sacrifice for one another. Suffer for one another. Let nothing be done in strife and vain glory. But every man look upon others and do for others better than they do themselves. Brothers and sisters, there was something, a piece of paper that I stole from my daddy over 50 years ago out of one of his sermons. And I keep it in my Bible, which is why it is so ragged. I gave it one time at PTP and a lot of the young ministers came up and said, can I take a picture of that? And I let them take a picture of it. And I'm sure it was an original, but it came out of one of my daddy's old books. And he used to use it all the time to talk about the fact that we are our own worst enemy. We fight each other. We hate each other right now with all of the racial issues going on in this country right now. But we're teaching young black children and white children to hate each other. And that this country is no good and not worth saving in a racist nation. Don't you understand something? That a man will not die for that which he does not believe. And if we raise a generation that don't believe in this country, that don't believe in the church, that don't believe in our traditions, don't believe in the Bible, then we're going to be a sitting duck and an easy target for those that covet what we've got and are jealously looking with a greedy eye upon taking the things that we leave behind. That was an old statement of war. Your enemy gets strong on what you leave behind. And I don't think I have to go any further to some current examples of that. My dad said, if the sleeping folks would wake up, and if all the lukewarm people would fire up, and all the dishonest folks would confess up. And the disgruntled folks would sweeten up. And the discouraged folk would cheer up. The depressed folk look up. The estranged folks would make up. If, the, if the, those who are in sin would confess up. If the gossipers would shut up. Just shut up. If the delinquents would pay up. The dry bones would shake up. If all the members would stand up and study up, if the preachers and elders would speak up, then the true soldiers would stand up and we can change all the things that are happening around us. It is only when we compromise. It is only when we run, when we drop our head and round our shoulders and let the devil beat us down 
that we find ourselves not doing what God has commanded us to do. Paul said to the brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Sitting in this room right now are young people. And I'm going to sit down. I've been talking too long. But sitting in this room right now are young people who are 25% of the population. But they're 100% of the future. Our children are our ambassadors that we send to a time that we will not see. On my piano in Memphis, I got a picture of my father. He's been dead for almost 15 years. My mother, who's been dead since 1971. My grandmother, who's been gone since 1995. My grandfather, who died one year later in 1965. My big mama and big papa, who died when I was in the seventh grade. All of those pictures with many others of my family that are sitting on there as a memorial to lives that used to be. But I stand here, and I represent them and their beliefs and their culture and their tradition and the things that they fought for and died for. My father was a Korean War veteran, and I stand here as their ambassador to a time that they didn't get a chance to see. If we don't raise our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, as it was said in that day, that in one generation, in one generation, they had turned from the Lord. And in those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. I want to leave you with this as we conclude and close there was an old farmer that sat in his house looking out of his window and he looked out in the snow as he sipped on his coffee while the fire is burning warm in his house. And he looked out of the blinds and he could see the birds. They were all together shivering on the, wire, the telephone wire or whatever wire was up there. And they were side by side shivering in the snow and in the cold and he had compassion. He set his coffee down and he went out to his barn and he opened his barn door wide open and went back in the house hoping that the birds might go into the barn where there was warmth and safety from the cold and the snow. As he stood there with his coffee in his hand looking through the blinds, the birds flew down right at the door and they looked in to the room. It was big and it was foreign and they flew back up to the wire. So he went down and he got breadcrumbs and he put the breadcrumbs all the way inside the barn saying that they will see that I'm friendly and I'm on their side and they'll eat the breadcrumbs and find out there is warmth and safety inside of my barn. He went back feeling good about himself with his coffee in his hand and he looked through the blinds and the birds would come and they would eat right up to the door. And they would look inside that foreign room, that place that they didn't know, and they would fly back up to the, the wire. He repeated this two or three times. He turned the light on. He opened the door on the backside of the barn. He did everything he could. And he realized that this place, this barn, was foreign. They didn't know it. They didn't trust it. And they were not going in. He said, if I could only be a bird for a minute, if I could only be a bird for a minute so I could go and say, it's okay. Y'all can go in here. It's safe. It's all right. If God, if you could just let me be a bird for a minute so I could tell them that it was safe. Well, you know, David spoke one time, though I walk through the shadow of the, the valley in the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. God sent Jesus to this world. And he became a man so he could show us there is no fear of death. There is no fear of sorrow. If you follow me and you come to me, I will wipe away all tears, all sorrow, all pain, all sickness. He became a man to show us the way to the truth and to eternal life. When God looked at that cross, when I hear the scriptures and I hear the truth, 
and I believe it, and I repent of my sins, and I acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, and I put him on in watery grave of baptism and rise to walk in the newness of life. I'm hearing the story of that middle cross, a thief on the right, a thief on the left, but that man in the middle. When God looked at that middle cross, he saw me. He saw you. 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 When he looked at that middle cross, he didn't see just the sinless son of God. He saw our substitute. Jesus didn't just die for my sins. Jesus died in my place. And God had to see me, us, because he was dying for us. We deserve death. We deserve the punishment. He never sinned, neither was guile found in his mouth. And when the day comes, if we haven't repented, if we've fallen away and acknowledged our truth and asked for forgiveness, when God sends Jesus to get his children, just as he looked at that middle cross and he saw us, when he looks at us, he better see Jesus.